All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I appreciate you guys coming out uh, for one of the end of day talks. It gets a little trickier to stay awake. Um, I'm Clyde C. Passat. I head up the training and certification group at the Linux Foundation. We have been at it for a good 10 years, figuring out that you do, in fact, need some training and certification. The fact that it's open source doesn't magically implant it in your brain. Uh, and uh, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about the talent side of the equation. Um, while most of our uh, comrades are working on code and actually building great code. And so the training team works on the backside of that to figure out, okay, yeah, there's great code. What can we do to, to get more uh, talent ramped up as both contributors and users of the ecosystem? And, uh, and I'm Jay White. I work on the open source strategy ecosystem team at Microsoft. I'm here on behalf of my fearless leader who couldn't be here uh, today, but I am her uh, hiring manager alternate on, on the team so I can speak directly to the challenges that are experienced uh, with uh, building and retaining teams uh, in this kind of market, but also um, how to help scale what's already in your organization and ramp them up to join your team doing uh, maybe sometimes very different things. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to run through a prepared slide presentation. It's a small group, so just raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, we'll stop as we go along. Um, it's interesting, you know, we submitted this this talk right when we were at peak layoff, I think, happening <laughs> this year. And they were like, is talent shortage still a real thing? Because there's hundreds of thousands of people on the market. Well, actually, it turns out most of those people got another job within six or eight weeks of their last job. And uh, if you talk to hiring managers, those of you who are hiring managers in here or on the back end of waiting for new colleagues to come in through the hiring process, the issue of talent availability did not magically disappear when the economy got tight. It's still very real uh, and it's real across the world. So even post pandemic with remote hiring, uh, we're still hearing that pretty consistently. And so the idea behind this talk was to say, hey, What's really happening out there? And what strategies are available to organizations that are kind of permanently stuck with open seats that they wish they could fill? Uh, and you know, the old definition of insanity. Is, <laughs> you have to do something a little bit different if for the last five years you haven't been able to get as much cloud talent as you'd like to have available. And so we're gonna explore a little bit about that. Um, do we have an intro slide? And then, Jay, maybe just talk a little bit about kind of the... Uh, sure thing. So, <laughs> the so we, have, <laughs> we have a few pictures up here, right? Talking, thinking about economic crisis. You hear this across your organizations, right? Um, there's a flux now, and, and you hear things like, oh, we have, re we have churn and, and revenue downturn, and you know, this organization's hurting over, our customer's hurting over here. That's our main source of revenue, so we can't make this budget this year, and it's gonna be, and it's, it's a domino effect, right? So you hear that. Um, you know, and then, of course, you'll hear panics when it comes to you know, people getting laid off, and now you have problems in the housing market, and that whole bubble is, bubble is bursting. And you, you see all those things represented there. What it comes down to is, uh, how are companies who have come off of COVID and they have these buildings that they've been leasing, that they've been putting all this money into, their employees are now working from home. They're asking their employees to come back. But they're coming back into a storm where now there's no money for your free snacks. And there's, there's, no, there's no money for your, for your catered lunches, right? What? The, the lunches are going away? The lunches are going away. You're not going to see the a la carte. You're not going to see the chef hats. You know, they're not there anymore, right? Um, so you have those kind of things that have created a situation now where you have not only the layoffs we're talking about, but you have uh, attrition. And everyone's stampeding outdoors of companies, what they call the, the great resignation and all that kind of stuff, right? People are leaving companies now. People are starting their own companies now. I mean, I can do it better myself, right? Why, why should I go work for this company and, and make this much money for them when I could make a fraction of it, make a fraction of what they're making revenue-wise, and I can keep it for myself? I'm talented enough. Why, why, why not? Right? You see all kinds of things happen. So you know, there is this idea that there is a uh, change in the availability of talent because of the cutback, because every time you turn on the news, there's another wave of you know, wave three of layoffs at XYZ sort of megacorp. 
Um, just this week, those of you who were in the keynote on Wednesday, Jim referenced this, we released our new 2013 State of Tech Talent report that tried to put some data around what actually is happening out there at a macro level in terms of talent availability. And it turns out what's happening is not what you would think was happening if all you did was read the headlines about wave upon wave of layoffs. Um, yes, it's real, but what the data says is that unlike past uh, economic downturns, this time around, a lot more of the people who were affected were pretty high earning, kind of fairly senior folks uh, who had been kind of hoarded at different organizations because we're in-house. Turns out that those expensive people, when the economy gets tight, you start thinking about, can I really afford to keep them? So the two things came out in the survey. One was it actually affected a more senior level than had happened in past downturns. And the second was that even those companies that had cut back and done layoffs were continuing to hire with a focus more on entry-level talent on some of the top uh, areas of skill gaps like cyber and, and cloud and AI. And so when you think about talent pools, I'm sorry, go ahead. I have, a, I have a, a, a thought. I have a thought. Right? Um, it begins with automation, one. Um, there's also, uh, when you consider what does a VP do today? I'm not, are there any VPs in the room right now? <laughs> I promise I'm not getting ready to crap all over you. I promise that I'm not getting ready to crap all over you. But uh, let's imagine this. You reach the illustrious title of VP in an organization. Now you've been sitting there 10 years, right? You've built up this, uh, this fantastic org under you. And it's very uh, bottom heavy with you at the top. You may have a few directors, maybe a few more senior managers that are driving all this work below. All you're doing is now reporting metrics up, right? How are these metrics getting generated? Not, it's not a PowerPoint anymore, right? Somebody's not doing a PowerPoint for you and you're not having to get this metric from this person, this metric from this person, this metric from this person, build a round table, okay, this is what I'm gonna present to the, to the, to the president, or this is what I'm gonna present to the C-suite. These things are now automated. And now you have this wonderful dashboard that's automated. So when a C-suite is now looking at how do we increase revenue, how do we improve, so we want to develop this new cool tool. I'm going to tell you right now, AI. Let's, let's look at the whole AI, let's say evolution. AI has been around for, for, for a long time now. We're, we're just catching up. But, but, the, but the, the, the whole AI evolution, right? Every major organization now is trying to find money to put in to this technology and, and be the first to market with something cool and fancy. Where's the money coming from? So if you look and say, well, who do we need more? The talking head here or the developer down there? Looking for logic here is not necessarily the appropriate path, because especially in the case of public companies where they have to answer to shareholders, you know, like logic's out the window, right? And so you just have lemmings at this particular point. laid off. So this is kind of what I mean when I say oh, these would be okay. the people that I would think would provide the most value to the company as opposed to entry level. You need both. I'm not saying one or another, but the senior engineers also got the chop at some company. So that yeah. to me is baffling. Yeah, I'll, so on that end, I'll, I'll, I'll follow the point he made. Very illogical. What I will say is this. Um, you have concepts now, not really a concept, but I guess, I guess solution, memory safe languages. So you're more senior engineers. You're, you're more what I consider to be old school engineers. Are they coding in what's considered memory safe languages today? Are they doing that? 
Or are they asking the younger developers to do that? Are they saying, okay, well, show us uh, what's being done? To an organization who has to move fast, remember, you still have SLOs that need to be met. The organization is moving fast. Are you going to wait on the senior, senior engineer to get plussed up? Or are you going to bring in that new, budding, fresh out of college who just got finished coding in something like Rust? He, just, he spent his whole entire collegiate experience coding in Rust, and he can come in and build whatever the hell you want. Or are you going to say, hey, senior engineer, go to like a 12-week course that we're going to pay for. We're going to fly you out to pay for, put you up in lodging and everything else, learn Rust and come back. I, I mean, I, like I said, illogical in nature. I'm just giving a... You know. I, uh, I often think of a client I had, a uh, German guy who, whenever there was a downturn, his mantra was always, uh, costs walk on two legs. <laughs> uh, it is a difficult time to be a hiring manager, as, as I think all of you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. So we have our challenges here, right? And then we talked about the resignations uh, earlier on, right? Great resignations, and you got the layoffs and uh, things like retention hiring. I mean, you see, you see the slide there, right? Um, the, the, to me, in my mind, the most important two you see here are the two down there on the, on the right, the legacy technologies and the emerging technologies. Boy, aren't, uh, aren't those two different ends of the coin when you think about hiring challenges. Why is that? That's because the newer individuals coming in have no idea about legacy technologies and the older individuals sometimes get so complacent that they take their eye off the ball of what's emerging. That's why it's wonderful to be in information security. It's wonderful to be in information security because I have no choice but to keep my eye on what's coming up next, right? Um, now, when it comes to the hiring challenges, though, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you my story on how I found my way into the open source uh, strategy ecosystem team. I just told you I'm a security guy, through and through. I got hurt. I was a combat soldier and got hurt in the military on, on my second deployment. Um, I was jumping out of planes and doing things that are, that are a little bit uglier in nature. Anyway, I got hurt. I found myself getting reclassed, uh, first to HR and I hated life, then to, uh, to, to IT, where I found a, a whole different set of, set of challenges. But what that allowed me to do was to get plussed up on, you know, I went, to, went back to school, got information security degrees, did all that kind of stuff, and found my way into information security. Spent my entire career, 20-something years, doing information security when I applied for a job at Microsoft, got turned down. 40 times, 40 times, the person who looked at my resume and said, I want to talk to him, was Sarah Novotny. Why does Sarah Novotny want to talk to me? She said it straight up. In your resume and through our conversation, I saw that you have a philosophy around building communities in information security. My whole career has been spent, even in the military, it was spent with, why the hell are we working in silos to solve these issues that we're all experiencing together? That makes no sense to me. And I brought that out into, into when I did information security and cybersecurity, supply chain security, everything else. Why are we talking about, why am I not getting all these business units together, forcing them into a room and saying, hey, why aren't we consuming open source software and third-party binaries the same way. Why isn't that done the same way? And so she saw that in my resume that I bring people together. What's open source? She said, I can teach, you can't teach that. I can teach you everything else. That was, that was uh, March, actually I talked to her in January. I started Microsoft March 21st last year. I'm sitting here presenting in front of you today at the Open Source Summit. Come on. Come on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. There's no, there's no need to clap. I mean, it, it sounds great, but I'm hating life. You don't understand. This is, <laughs> this is, this is hard. It's harder than it looks. Okay? Just don't, don't well, clap for that. But I think but, that's a transition yeah, into... Yeah. So, so, so the, opportunity, <laughs> the opportunities, right? Look at your teams and beyond, right? Check out the broader community. Great talent is available. You have no idea where that talent is or where they come from. They could be doing something completely different. Uh, one of the things I saw that I see many uh, larger organizations doing, I guess some do, some smaller ones do it a little bit better, 
is they have these things like take one, take two, take threes, or these steps, right, where they'll say, hey, you've been here for a year, or you've been here for two years. Why don't you go spend a semester with this other team over there? You know, and then we'll take somebody from their team over here, and we'll cross-train, and then we'll send you back. Right? That's an excellent way to find talent within your organization. Because, you know, you, things get mundane. Things get to a point where you're sitting there and you're doing something and you get complacent. You, you, you end, I, I have one individual, a mentee of mine, that'll sit there and say, you know, I, 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 I liked what I was doing before, but now I'm just like going through the motions. Well, maybe this is an excellent opportunity for them to find something else in their organization that they might have more fun doing. Go ahead. Right, and tradition has its values in some contexts, but um, in, the, in the context of technology where things are ever-changing, um, at least if we're willing to recognize that, then this kind of legacy mindset is, is a problem, it's a liability, right? So the point that you're making about um, like this, this um, cross-functionality, essentially, is what you're looking for in these teams so that you can say, hey, you might have come into the organization to do this thing, and now we're moving you over here, and tell me what you think about it. So portability, like individual mm -hmm. portability, um, that requires a certain cultural buy-in. So I envy you if you're in an environment where they see the value of that, and I would encourage everybody to try to implement that if they can, because that is essentially the way forward, where basically you're able to, it's not about hiring from within, it's about recognizing the talent you already have. Absolutely, and I'll tell you right now, I've been fighting, uh, because of budget, they're not, they're not gonna give it to me, but I've been fighting to get my own team stood up to do all of this stuff. I'm in so many different places in open source now, it's not even funny. So I said, hey, I need help. I need to put people in this place. So instead of getting the help I need, I reached out to different engineering teams because I see, I, you know, I, I, did what, I did what was done for me. I looked at resumes. And I have five engineers right now that I have sitting in OpenSSF SIGs and working groups that, that are helping out, that they're hands on keyboard still, doing what they love, right? but participating in these communities such that they're getting skills from other individuals, right? That they're, they're pulling in skills, right? They're having these conversations and they're loving it. They hold meetings for me, they, they love it, right? So finding that talent from within is key too to help build up those teams. And they may not be direct reports to you, right? But you can actually help them develop unto themselves and then provide evaluation so that they can grow internally to their own teams because they have a leg up that they're people on the teams don't have, and that's the skills you're teaching. It's interesting how the problem gets phrased, right? So for those of you who are hiring managers, when you don't fill a role, the question is always, why didn't you fill the role? Did you not advertise in the right place? Mm -hmm. Did you not use the right recruiter? Nobody ever comes and says, why didn't you grow your own talent to be able to fill those, right? The mindset in too many places is go outside, LinkedIn is your talent buffet. Yeah. Find the good passive candidates, sick a recruiter on them, pay 30% upfront, and you should get the result you want, which is to poach some existing talent from somewhere else and plug them into a hole. And nobody is saying that you should not do that, but a single strategy of buying talent in will never get you where you need to be, right? And it's sort of interesting that you think that people have learned this over the past five, 10 years, but there's some sort of momentum around culture and behavior where they just keep, you know, they keep ramping up the recruiter budgets. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, how about do that plus do a couple of different things to try to figure out other ways to fish for talent in non-traditional places and to look for ta potential talent within your existing organization. Um, companies know what challenges they face, right? You know, it's interesting, historically, when you look back, big waves of tech change had typically been coming kind of one at a time, right? So you had the, you know, mainframe wave, and then you had a desktop wave, and then you had a, you know, virtualization wave, and then you had a, you know, containerization wave. But when you look at it now, it's sort of like, there's like five things coming at you simultaneously, right? Your board is asking you about generative AI, the security people are down your throat, talk, you know, <laughs> paranoid about whether you're going to be on the front page of the new tomorrow. You still have a giant pile of legacy app monoliths running in a basement somewhere that nobody wants to deal with because it's not sexy to work on. And you don't get to pick and choose 
you know, yeah. hey, Jay, I'll do your security thing <laughs> next year, okay? Because I'm <laughs> working on this other thing right now. So the talent problem has actually gotten worse because now you're trying to address multiple major technology shifts in a context where you already didn't have the amount of talent that you need to do. And by the way, you still have a serious legacy, you know. There's a whole different talk we could give about legacy systems and people pretending like they'll happen, keep working forever because they work today. And at some point the music stops and <laughs> you have to deal with, with legacy yeah. technologies and how many people still know how to run it. Uh, and, and especially now because, you know, the big sea change from a year ago is all of a sudden come the market cares about profitability and budgets have gotten a lot tighter. And so talk about doing more with less. <laughs> Everybody's looking at your cost structure, but they're also expecting you to go. And you know, so, so you, um, and, I, and I don't know your name, I apologize. Gr green sweater, yes. You made an excellent point earlier about the senior engineer, letting them go, right? Well, these are the individual, this is how organizations suffer, right? Need to keep and maintain legacy systems. Those individuals understand the legacy systems that are in place and then be a let go. Um, I was just in the hall talking about this, and I said, um, actually, yeah, yeah the, the, some of the individuals in the hall when I said this, I said, if you want to defeat a new system today, as a pen tester, you want to defeat a new system, write your program in Fortran, right? <laughs> that's, that's, because cause there isn't a new system out there that'll read that, but guess what? Your legacy systems might. But trying to scrap those for the new shiny, the shiny new things, now, you can't get away from a lot of them especially because some of these new systems might hold, uh, you know, some of the crown jewels and you sit there and you make them bastion hosts, right? You take them off your network and sometimes you just connect them to, you know, update something. If something can be updated on it, right? Shrug, who knows? Some of the systems can't even be patched. But for an organization to keep and maintain these systems because it's incredibly hard now because of that attrition, because of those layoffs that occurred. So now you're asking, a, a younger individual, A, get plussed up on this. Huh? Question. Why has the apprenticeship model phased out? Instead of arming recruiters with a bunch of money, hoping they're throwing darts at a wall and hitting high quality talent, why not cultivate and upskill your talent when there's actually studies that show there's higher retention models with that? And you're teaching them not only to handle the legacy systems, but additionally, you're teaching them about, them about the new software that's rolling out as well. Funny enough, for the very thing that just happened, right? Job security, which now is is a is, is an oxymoron the right term for that? <laughs> right? Like we are all scared to death for months, right? Um, but but what you just talked, right? To teach somebody to make yourself obsolete, that was always especially for your senior folks, that was always the thing. Hey, I, got, I wanna make myself obsolete. I want you to know, if I can teach you and teach my whole team how to do all this work, I can sit back, just take your metrics and report those things out. I'm not, I'm not needed, but. Uh, well, <laughs> when your backside, why not do something else? Okay, right, right. So make yourself obsolete so you can do something else. I'll add that in, yes. So that you can step up. The idea is, and, and this was something that I've always said, if, look, if, I, if I have a team and I move up, guess what, you move up too, right? If I move, you move up too. But that's not the, the case as we clearly see, right? The fear, the, the idea that if I move up, you move up too, that was always the case. But then there was also that fear that if, you know, hey, wait, what if there's no place to move up? What if this, what if this is the limit, right? Then you're like, well, I'm not going to teach them how to do that because then they can take my place and at a lower, at a lower uh, cost point, right? justifiable but you know with the attention economy the way that it is people are just like you know squirrel squirrel they're looking for other opportunities because they don't have justification they don't have evidentiary uh, reasons with regards to why they might be able to live out the rest of their career at the organization that they're at now right so uh, so long as people are constantly questioning their value and that is not being articulated to them by the people that are um, whose opinions they value they will constantly be looking over their shoulder for the next opportunity yeah you, you still have a um Unfortunately, 
unfortunately. This is still a, a who you know, uh, not what you know game. Um, so the individuals you find in seats that have impact and influence are oftentimes not the individuals that know the, the wealth and breadth of the organization. Those individuals are still making sure the organization has wealth and breadth to know about, right? And um, that's really the opportunity, yeah. right? Is, yeah. you know, cast your mind back to three years ago, how many people in senior positions would categorically rule out the idea of a remote workforce? Mm -hmm. Never could happen, can't trust people, you lose, I mean, those same people, not all of them, but many of them have found religion in, wow, Turns out they work more if they're not spending four hours in traffic trying to get to the office. And there's only so much, you know, free haircuts and lunch can get you. Uh, cultural change is hard, right? When you're trying to change 40 years of how things were done, you know, you have to try some different things. And you're not always going to have a pandemic that sort of forces you to, to take stuff off, right? So there's one strategy which a lot of companies have woken up to that they would have categorically said didn't work for a whole bunch of reasons and they're now saying oh actually this is great we can go find people in different locations we can bring them on they could be totally productive but if you have that same discussion about upskilling the legacy COBOL Fortran programmer they look at you like you have two heads say oh that's a where has it worked like I haven't seen it work and b how long is that going to take? Yeah. So I find it, I've always found the whole argument that you can't really rule out a remote workforce to be disingenuous. We are sitting here because of Linux. Linux was built by people working from home. All the top people that work on Linux and most of the rest of us have been working what? from home for well over 20 years. Well, Linux right. was from 92, and it wasn't until the pandemic that a lot of organizations... I understand that, but what I'm saying is, is, that, is that many of those organizations are, are using Linux and, and have, have grown on Linux and, and, and uh, uh, built their entire uh, businesses around Linux, and yet the technology upon which they are were built from it, it was people not working remotely. And, and I know lots of people, certainly in the kernel community, who will only work remotely. Yeah, it was not uh, for a lack of that, uh, even at companies that require people to work, uh, right. you know, uh, co-located, they still work right. from home. Yeah. It was not for a lack of evidence that it could work. It was for me a lack of practice of actually seeing it work at scale in organizations like themselves. You know, one of the challenges I think you asked about mentorship. Uh, it takes patience to grow talent in house, right? You don't just drop somebody in and yeah. two weeks later they're productive. Yeah. But it also takes patience to onboard a new employee. It takes you six months for the recruiter to find the person, and it takes three or four months to teach them how to do it. Then half of them leave after six months because the next recruiter puts them on to the next thing. But yet somehow, the idea of saying, I'm gonna invest in this guy for a year to upskill him seems like heretical, right? But it's, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you take an all of the above strategy to saying, I can't hire my way out of this problem, so I should try some hiring, I should try some cross-skilling, I should try some remote, I should go to some, you know, the community college on the outskirts that I've never been to before and try to find some young folks that maybe don't have a degree mm -hmm. and take an all of the above strategy to sort of try to develop that talent because you know what, it's true. Maybe half that talent moves on after a year and goes on to something else. Are you better off by keep having the half that remain part of your organization than you would be if you didn't do it at all? Mm -hmm. Of course you are. And it's dramatically cheaper, right? For what you would spend on a single recruiter, you could probably upskill a dozen people in your organization mm -hmm. if you have the patience to let them work through it for six months, nine months, a year, and get them up to that point because the one thing you know is they're already a fit for your organization, right? You're gonna pick people that have been in the organization, that understand the work culture, that understand the style of it. But there's an, there's an element of trying different things and being patient to let them pan out that is new, right? It's not unlike remote work three years ago.
and there's plenty of evidence that it works, how do organizations get their head to a different place where they're willing to try using some of these strategies in addition to the current strategies of browse LinkedIn till you see a nice resume? Because you have to have all of the above. I have a question there. If you were going to champion this, so if, if COVID issued the new wave of having people rethink remote work, how could we issue that next paradigm of getting back to non-traditional talent pools, mentorship, apprenticeship, who, who are those internal champions inside of legacy companies like Linux to go to to have these discussions? I imagine it's not HR, it would more so be senior management or who? All of the storytelling yeah. like Jay's story. Yeah, right? a, lot, a lot of these, um, uh, let me put it like this. I spearheaded a program, this is a, co this is a, few, a couple of companies ago. Uh, when we had, they were talking about, you know, we need more cybersecurity folks, or we need to get some, some, some huh, we need to get some junior level cybersecurity people with five years experience, and this and that. I was like, guys, I don't know what the hell. So, look, understand something. We, 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 we skipped over a, a, a talking point we had, and that was around with the recruiters and the job postings that you see online. What if I told you there's a portion of that job posting that we have no control over? And that's the preferred and required requirements. We have no control over that area. We have control of everything above that, where we describe the role, we describe the team, what you'll be doing, et cetera. But when it comes down to that preferred or that required, where it says required, four-year degree, we have no control over that. That's put there by HR, and HR says that needs to be there for, for purposes, for legal purposes, I guess. I don't know. I, I shrug. Well, hold on a second. I'm, I'm, get, I'm, get, I'm, get, I'm, I'm getting ready to get there. So, a program that I had, right? Two things. One, it said, well, what if we reached out to people on LinkedIn or reached out to people, uh, you know, get the resumes in and then say they don't have any degrees? We, we circumvent the whole hiring process. We became the hiring man. We became the recruiter, right? Um, so, we did that, right? But there was another thing. I said, guys, why aren't we looking inside of the business? Why aren't we looking inside of like finance? in accounting, and on uh, and your, and uh, your business managers for cyber talent. They looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, um, I look, right, once again, I told you, I got my information security bones in the DOD, Home of Information Security. I went to school specifically for information security. I'm probably one of the few folks in information security today that has actually have an educational foundation in it. So I said, Information security is a business function. It's not a tech function. Why aren't we going to business people who already have learned business and bringing them in to teach them cyber? They can think cyber from a business perspective, and then they can articulate risk, impact, and recommendation in terms that the C-level will understand so that maybe it's not so hard getting budget dollars. I don't know. I shrug. Uh, we did have a little beat up uh, yeah, on HR we, section in here, which you can skip through. I know we're mindful of time yeah, as well, we right? Have. But uh, one of the fundamental challenges is we did have a couple more when you look across fu functions that HR fills, technology has always been an outlier where it's hard for HR folks to fully understand the requirements of the role you're trying to fill, mm -hmm. right? You as the hiring manager know what you're trying to hire. And, but the roles are so technical, and oftentimes your HR professional just kind of glazes over. It's like, oh, okay whatever above the line, yeah. but here's what needs to go below the line. Four years of work experience, college degree, willing to relocate because that's our standard package of how we do things. And unless somebody three levels up the food chain says it's okay to change it, I, mid-level HR manager, don't really feel like mucking with it because what's the upside for me? Right. And uh, it's, not, it's not their fault, by the way. It's shadow, yeah. Um, and, I, and I'll get to your question in just a second. So I was going, just going to say that um, to um, support your argument that you have to be creative looking around and growing this kind of homegrown talent. That's the word people use. And some of the com companies I have been at, they have done um, a, a summer uh, professional growth type program with uh, cross uh, pollinating. That's another kind of bringing 
everybody together. And I would participate. I have participated as a mentee to somebody um, to understand what their business different. If you have a large company, nobody knows what other group is doing. So the only way to know is interacting with somebody that is willing to teach another person. So these programs have been very effective in the company I have been. So that's kind of what you're talking about. Absolutely. And they also ask the questions, what are you waiting for? Or why don't you go do something? And there is a vision, the companies have to have the vision and commitment to the employees that they hire. And some of the companies I have been at, they have given me, given everybody 10% of your time is yours to advance your career and we will support you. So those are the things we need more of happening for us to be able to have a workforce that would be ready for future. It's a great point because we talked a, earlier a bit about the patience required to grow talent in-house. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's required that we have not historically asked of our tech talent is to invest time in mentorship, yeah. right? So the idea that the recruiter finds this great candidate that you can somehow magically plug and play and on day two they're productive doesn't ask much of the hiring manager or of their colleagues in terms of mentoring, growth, and support. But if you're going to grow talent, somebody's got to do it, right? Somebody's got to find the time to line up with these folks and meet with them and coach them and guide them. And that is, again, part of the change management function is now we're asking our developers and our engineers to proactively invest the time in that next generation of talent that's coming up behind them. And now you're talking about capacity planning and prioritization. So it's not something you just flip the light switch on, right? It's something that has to be a commitment from the organization that this is a way that they want to, to work. I'm mindful of the time. I'm going to skip forward a few here um, and talk about this from two perspectives. Uh, the perspective of the person at a lower level inside the organization thinking about what's next and the perspective of the newbie trying to start a career in tech which is challenging. <laughs> how do I come in and how do I come in when all, every headline I see is that more layoffs are happening? Um, but I know we're, uh, maybe we... Uh, you yeah, so you, I mean, you see the challenges here. Um, one of the things that I like to tell uh, newer folks that want to get in, and that's whether they're transitioning from a previous career that they already had, or whether they're fresh, like in school or trying to figure out what to study. I tell them, I need you to get as creative as humanly possible. Long gone are the days where you're going to find a position that's static. There are no more static positions. Um, you've got to get creative, create your own lane and put that on a resume and put that out into a position you think it fits in. Just one thing, you, just one position you think it fits in. Reach out, do, do your homework, become a hacker, become a hacker. Find a person in that organization, talk them up, talk them up to the point where they begin to try to point you at different people. Find the hiring manager for that position that way and get your resume in front of them that way. Because oftentimes, you're gonna put your resume into that, into that uh, application system and, you, and they're gonna weed you out. The system's set up to weed you out. Um, hold on, hold on one second, I'll get one second. It's gonna, it's gonna weed you out. Uh, it's gonna weed you out because like I said, and I was gonna say this before, it's not the HR people's fault. Tech, as much of it is as a science, it's also an art form, it's so beautiful. It's a beautiful art. And every single industry, every single company in that industry, every single business unit in that company does it different. So, so in order to effectively get there, you got to say, well, how can I differentiate myself? What do I like to do? And then what do I love to do? And put those damn things together, right? And create your resume that way. So for the new person in college or the new person say, hey, I want to jump in. Well, what, what do you like to do? Well, I like, uh, I don't know. I, I like, I like psychology. Psychology, no, I don't care what anybody says. Psychology is not a major, right? Psychology, the best is a minor or something like that. Well, what, what, is, it, what is it that you love to do? Well, I love, I love working with animals. Excellent. Write an app 
that describes the behavior of animals. I don't know. I shrug the shoulders. Write an app that does that and fall in love with it. Right? Fall in love with it. You're in the game now. Right? You're doing something you like. You're doing something you love. And you're putting technology. Let technology be the glue that, that drives it together. And now you can market that to an organization. Hey, I built this. Go ahead. You can contribute to an open source project unencumbered mm -hmm. by corporate interests, and then you get a lot more visibility as a result of that, and a lot more respect, and become a member of a multitude of different communities. So it is actually the red pill that you want to take. Damn, I forgot I was at an open source conference for a second. <laughs> yeah. It's great that you say that, right? I've had this, arg well, it's not really an argument anymore. It's more like an open discussion inside of, of Microsoft and with other, uh, our other partners and competitors as well, open source is the way now. It's a business driver now. It's no longer something that, oh, that looks real cool over there. Let's see if we can bring it in and make it part of this and make it part of that. No, companies are now taking open source packages, bringing them into their organizations, slapping a new label on them, and sending them out the door. They're business drivers now, they're revenue generators. Next time we'll bring our Mandalorian helmets because, you know, this is the way. Uh, is the I know way. we're out of time. Um, <laughs> the one thing, just quickly before we wrap, uh, non-traditional talent pools and folks who maybe can't see themselves in an IT career because they don't know anybody who's had an IT career. And because of that, they look at the news and they think, layoff, layoff, layoff. I already didn't know anybody in it, and now everybody who's there is getting fired, so... Um, maybe I'll do psychology. <laughs> yeah, you've got to read. There is so much good talent out there. When you add this on to the whole availability of you know, openness to remote work, you know, don't fish where you caught the fish yesterday, right? Fish where the fish are now. But bear in mind that that non-traditional audience is probably not feeling super bullish yeah. on a tech career, right? And so what are you going to do to give them the confidence that there's opportunity here. Right? How are you going to paint that picture? Because it's not the picture they're seeing in the news. Right? So be mindful of where their heads are at right? and, and create some on-ramps for them where they can see possibility. All right, I know we're running over and there's probably folks outside, so why don't we wrap it? Appreciate you all coming. Thanks for being part of the conversation.